All right, we're back. It's been a while, but welcome, SpudFit episode, SpudFit podcast, sorry, episode 15 with Emma Roche today. It's been a while. Life gets in the way. I've been busy. Uh, things happen. No excuses, just reasons. And uh, anyway, we're back to it. This uh, podcast is hard to do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And uh, But anyway... I'm not complaining. I'm just uh, saying the way it is. So it's been a while since I've had the chance to be able to, number one, sit down with someone for a long time and have a conversation. And number two, find the time to actually produce the sound files and upload and do everything that goes along with them. It takes quite a lot of effort uh, and a lot of time. I love doing it. I wish I had the time to do it more often, but sometimes I've got to spend some time doing things that actually get the bills paid or uh, <laughs> spend some time doing uh, being a father and being a husband and uh, spud fit stuff can get neglected. Anyway, we're back and we're doing another episode with Emma Roche, the amazing and lovely Emma Roche from plantplate.com. I'll talk a little bit more about her in a minute. First, if you want to get involved in things that I'm doing, the first thing you could do is join the DIY Spud Fit Challenge. Oh, sorry, buy the DIY Spud Fit Challenge. That's a book that uh, my wife and I wrote together. The first half of it is all about uh, the logistics and the psychology behind doing your own Spud Fit Challenge. And the second half is recipes. By the way, if you're new to this show and you, ha- you don't know who I am, uh, my name's Andrew Taylor. I'm your host. I should have probably said that earlier. <laughs> I'm the guy that ate only potatoes for all of 2016 and uh, and I had some amazing health improvements along the way uh, and I've improved my life in many, many ways and this podcast is about trying to continue to improve my life by speaking to people that can help me do that and hopefully help you at the same time. So the book, The DIY SpudFit Challenge is available on the website spudfit.com and it's also available as an ebook or paperback version on amazon.com and also on iBooks, iTunes. So there, that, that is one thing you can do. The second thing is you, if you want to do your own SpudFit Challenge, you can do it by yourself if you like, as I did, or you could j- sign up to take the challenge with me and with a group of friends. On, uh, on Facebook, go to spudfit.com and uh, you'll find more information there about how you can join up and take the challenge and get it done supervised and with support from me and many other wonderful people in that group. If you like what I'm doing, of course, you can share it. That'd be great. And you could su- subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. Uh, that'd be awesome. And we've also... I've also decided to uh, bring in another couple of options. First of all, I've created an Amazon affiliate account. And what that means is that uh, if you want to support me in this podcast and you want to shop on Amazon, you can do both at the same time. You could go to my website, spudfit.com, and you could click on the Amazon banner ads in there that uh, take you to Amazon, buy whatever you were going to buy. It doesn't cost you a cent extra, but I get a little bit of... uh, Loose change, commission change that uh, could help me uh, with finding the time to do this episode more often, do this podcast more often, sorry. So that'd be very helpful if you can go to the website, click on the Amazon banner ad and get me a little bit of commission money for that. And the second thing is if you want to take things to the next level, I have had quite a few people ask about this option and now it's available. You could go to patreon.com forward slash spudfit you can go straight there or you can go there's a link in the in the show notes for this episode you can go to patreon.com forward slash spudfit and you could become a patron of the show and you could pledge uh, any amount of money that could you could donate once off or you can do it make it a monthly thing and you can help support this show and uh, and support my work in general in trying to spread the message of good health um That'd be, I would be super grateful and super appreciative if, uh, if people did that. You don't have to. I don't want people to um, spend money they don't have on trying to support me. Uh, I'm going to be making this for free anyway. So it's not like you're not going to be able to listen if you don't pay. You can, this is just if you, 
if you feel so inclined and you have the means available to support me, then that would be lovely. All right, Emma. Emma's great, as you're about to find out. Emma runs a website called plantplate.com. She has a book called Whole Food Plant Based on $5 a day. And uh, her mission out of these things is to try to show people how simple and easy and cheap it can be to be truly healthy and uh, and live a whole food plant-based lifestyle. People seem to think that it's uh, it's only for the upper class. Whole food plant-based eating is only for the upper class and people with a lot of money and Emma goes a long way to uh, dispelling those myths. And not only that, she's just a fantastic, vibrant, happy person. She's uh, She's really good fun to sit down and chat with, so... I'm not going to waste any more of your time. Let's uh, get on with the show and let's listen to uh, what Emma has to say. Thanks for joining us. Spot up. Oh, I almost forgot to mention the most important show sponsor, the only show sponsor that I have is actually my wife, Mandy's business. It's called thedakery.com. D-A-K-K-E-R-Y. They are the most comfortable and amazing tracksuit pants that are on the on the market in anywhere in the world they'll keep you warm and they'll keep you comfy and they're just like a an amazing glorious hug for your bum but not only that they're made of organic cotton and bamboo they're all uh fair trade environmentally friendly and they have amazing artwork on them they are hence the name the daiquiri i don't know if if it's called the if we call this around the world Tracky Dax, tracksuit pants in Australia. We have a weird way of saying things. We call thing we call tracksuit pants or track pants. Tracky Dax. Shorten that to Dax. And then since they're covered in beautiful artwork, hence the name the Dacery, the Gallery of Dax. So anyway, enough about me. On with the show. Oh no, last thing. There's a sale on now. Buy one, get one free at thedakery.com, D-A-K-K-E-R-Y.com. Uh, so, support my wife's amazing work there. All right, now on with the show. Sput up. All right, Emma Roche, here we are on the Spud Fit Podcast. Thanks for uh, being my guest. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to, yeah, to do it and no, to meet you. No worries, yeah. And likewise, is, uh, I've been following your website for uh, a few years now. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to finally be able to sit down and, uh, and I've read a couple of your books too. So, it's good to be able to sit down and have a chat. Oh, that's so, awesome. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no worries. So, um, it's actually, it's been... Oh, it's been a few weeks since I released a podcast. I don't know when this one's going to be out, so maybe it'll even be a couple of months by then. But uh, anyway, it's a, you're, a, you're a good guest to have for the first one back after a bit of a break. Oh, that's very <laughs> kind. Thank you. Well, uh, I hope to be. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll see. I shouldn't, maybe I'm jumping the gun You might bit. be, you might be. We hope not. <laughs> yeah, let's just uh, reserve judgment for now okay. then. <laughs> All right. Um, so... My first question is always the same, and it's always interesting how people answer it. No pressure, but anyway, who is Emma Roche? Roche? Ro- Ro- yeah, Roche, Roche is good. I thought Roche, yeah. but I wasn't sure. Anyway, Whatever, you can yeah. say Roche, Roche. Yeah, I, I assume there's probably a lot of Aussies that would say Roche. Roche. Right. Roche, yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, um, who is Emma Roche? That is a good question. <laughs> I could be pretty boring and say, you know, I'm 29, I'm yeah. Australian, Um Grew up in Canberra. I've lived overseas for the last uh, eight or nine years now. I've lived in the UK. I've lived in Belgium. So cool. I've done quite a bit of traveling. Um, yeah, you know, I'm um, I'm a stepmom. Yeah. I've got a, you know, I'm a family person. I've got a great husband that I live overseas with. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people know me now through the website as somebody yep. who's really interested in uh, in basically helping other people learn how to eat healthily, how to do it simply and how to do it affordably. So that's been, yeah, that's been a very big focus for me for the past few years and I 
I think it is a, a become quite a big part of of who I am. So yeah, cool. And well, we might as well say the name of the website then. The name right. of the website is Plant Plate. Yeah. All right. Cool. And it's uh, yeah, like I was saying, it's a it's a pretty cool uh, resource that I've I've looked at over the last few years quite a number of times. So. Yeah, thanks off the top for, for running that. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, actually, as an aside, we were talking before the podcast, it turns out that we actually, for a period of time, lived not far from each other yeah. without actually knowing it. So uh, yeah, I lived in Rotterdam and you lived near Antwerp. So, you know, it's a it's a couple of hours yep. dro- probably, yeah. So, small world. Yeah. Closer world. than Melbourne and Canberra. Yeah. So do you speak Dutch then? I, I speak it a little bit and well, I, actually I speak the... A little, very well, but the rest badly, Yeah, okay. if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I, I had trouble learning Dutch, actually. It's difficult. It, it's difficult to, it's a difficult language, but harder than that is actually being able to practice because I would go out and the Dutch are excellent at English. I don't know how it is in Belgium, but in, in Rotterdam or all around uh, the Netherlands, they're excellent at English and... So I would go to shops or restaurants or whatever and I'd go, right, I'm going to speak Dutch. And as soon as I say one word, they go, ah, this guy's an English speaker. Yep. And then they switch to English and I can't practice. So. It's, <laughs> it's very much the same in the northern part of, uh, of Belgium in Flanders, very yeah. much like the Netherlands. And then when you go south, they speak French, right? Yes. Yeah. And so you either, you either seem to be stuck speaking English or French, which unfortunately I don't speak a word of. And yeah. it's, it's okay now... Because my Antwerp accent's all right, but I yeah. have the same issue if I go to Holland because my accent is nothing yeah. like theirs that they know straight yeah. away. Yeah, well, it was, I worked as a as a PE teacher there. Oh, great! And but I was in an international and bilingual school, and my job was to teach PE to Dutch kids, but in English. So they've got this amazing education system where uh, they have a lot of bilingual schools and. Uh, the Dutch kids do most of their education speaking English. Wow. So, yeah, my job was to speak English so that they could, the kids could practice. While they're doing PE, they're also practicing their English with me. So I didn't speak Dutch at work. I spoke English. And then, yeah, out and about, as soon as somebody picked up that I wasn't a Dutch speaker, they would switch to English. So I lived there for three years and I, could, I can speak a little bit of Dutch, but... You know, I could have a reasonable conversation with um, a toddler. <laughs> yeah, that's not uncommon. Yeah. I think I hear the same story from a lot of people, yeah. you know, from English-speaking countries. Yeah. You just make it, you get lazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, yeah, anyway, well, that's, uh, we're sort of getting sidetracked, but that's okay. That's all we're, right. We're allowed to do that. Um, so you haven't always been, uh, <clears throat> sorry, you haven't always been, uh, Mrs. Plant Plate and, no. uh, and, and Mrs. Veg- uh, vegan Whole Food Plant Based on $5 a day. Yeah, <laughs> that hasn't always been your thing. So what's a, a bit of your background? How did you get to be doing this? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I became vegetarian quite young, uh, mm. mostly for ethical reasons, but also I was interested in, in getting a little bit healthier. Um, then started with veganism when I was about 16, so probably... Oh, 16 yeah, and veganism. So yeah. how, how, how old were you when you got to vegetarianism then? 13. All right, that's quite young. It is quite young. Um, and I'm really glad I did because I think it's made every step of the transition to being whole food plant-based much easier because I was already, um, you know, already used to, you know, avoiding animal products yeah uh, well meat and then animal products and so it was it was was a a bit of a progression progression. um and yeah so so i i sort of i did i I did the switch to veganism about yeah so that would have been about 13 years ago now all right um and i like i said i was always quite health conscious i always tried to eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and tried to minimize junk food or say that for special occasions um but it wasn't until i read the china study i think i read it in 2011 that i started following more of the um you know more of the recommendations in line with the whole food plant-based diet so making sure to eat almost everything whole you know whole grain whole meal uh cooking without oil less refined foods less eating out um more 
just more and more of that. And even then it wasn't an overnight thing. It's sort of something that's become more closer and closer to 100% as the years have gone on. So, yeah, that's, right. that was pretty much it. Yeah, no, that's cool. So it's just a gradual step-by-step yeah. thing. It's inter- I always find it interesting because I'm very much an all-or-nothing kind of guy. Yeah. I'm not someone who can take those gradual steps like you described. Okay. But I, I envy that. I wish <laughs> I could do that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll I'm take a step forward and then two back. And, you know, I, I, think, just, I don't think yeah. you're alone there. <laughs> no, I don't think I'm alone. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm a cold turkey, all or nothing kind of guy. You know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all the way, all in one go. I kind and of that, envy that a yeah. little bit. I think that sometimes that might, <laughs> well, it doesn't always might work. be helpful. That's thing. Yeah. 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 But anyway, that's, uh, I'm interested in that. Uh, the the different ways, the different approaches that people have, and how it uh, you know, works in different ways for different people. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, so back to going back a bit uh, again. Though, you said you initially were it was an ethical sort of thing. Was yes. there some sort of event that happened in your life, or was that a gradual sort of awakening? Or it wasn't how did that work? really um, a major event. It just happened that. Um, I, I just, I guess I didn't know very many vegetarians or at least I didn't know that I knew many when I was young and I ended up having one very close friend um, in year seven, I think, and she was vegetarian. She'd been vegetarian since she was nine uh, and I, the same year, had a teacher that I really, really liked at school and she also happened to be vegetarian and I spent a lot of time with both of them and without them talking about it or getting into specifics I just sort of started to think about it more and think okay well why would you why would would they be be vegetarian what what's the reason and you know it, it's it comes back to that thing about not feeling good about eating mm. animals or um, using animals for food and I just it just sort of it did just sort of click with me one yeah. day that I wasn't that's not something I really agreed with I really liked animals and I didn't really enjoy eating meat that much to be honest and one day you know I sat down and I just I just couldn't I just went I really don't really don't want to eat this and I went and said to my mum I think I think I'm going to be vegetarian yeah (laughs) and she said okay thinking it would last a few days and yeah just a phase here we are you know (laughs) 16 17 years later and yeah and it's stuck so yeah, cool. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, so was it? Was there anything gradual about that, or was it? No, like, that was you... really like an overnight thing. Yeah, like I'm just stopping. You know, one day sat down to I think it was to eat a chicken wing yeah. or something. I still remember. Yeah, this yeah. definitely. So it wasn't I, like stop cows first and then stop pigs and no, then, I nah. think I did. I think I did continue with the seafood. Yeah. For a little while because. Um, Oh, I can't even remember why because I don't even think I liked seafood very much. So I can't see myself eating it. And then <coughs> that was probably a few months before I went, yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of the same thing to me. So I won't keep I yeah. won't keep doing that. And I probably I probably around four days into it changed my mind and ate something and then and then yeah. from that moment on it was completely yeah, right. completely finished. Yeah. Yeah, because this the you know the spud fit challenge the potato thing yeah. that i did was not uh a, not really about veganism it was just about me trying to get healthier yes. but I, people a lot of people don't realize that i was vegan for a long time before that but definitely a junk food vegan and um anyway just just as a fellow vegan it's uh it's interesting for me to hear stories of how other people got to it because you know we're all different we all get there in different ways so uh yeah thanks for sharing that with us too <laughs> ah, thank you for asking yeah. it is absolutely it's it's always a different yeah and well, you know some things. people get into it for ethics so like mine was ethics obviously mm-hmm. if it was for health i wouldn't have been eating so much yeah. junk but, <laughs> yep. uh, <laughs> but yeah you know and you you're in it for ethics but there's a lot of other people that i've spoken to on this podcast and and everywhere else as well that are into it for health reasons or yep. environmental reasons or whatever else so um, and it's interesting how it evolves too because so you've inv- evolved from more ethical towards health and so have I and yep. other people start at the environment and then evolve towards ethics and then health and yeah it's just it's all, all these ideas are so interesting to me so uh, anyway when, when you made that change to 
uh, vegetarianism first, but then veganism later. Was there some sort of moment that you had where you went like, "This really feels good, and this is working for me from you know an ethical perspective or a health perspective or anything"? Was there some sort of big moment where you went like, "Yeah, this is right for me. This feels good." Or um, I I don't know because I was vegetarian and I honestly didn't eat. I, I really barely was eating anything that was animal-based. Yeah, okay. And I think that that's why I sort of just said to myself, well, well I, practic- <laughs> I practically am anyway, so yeah. what's stopping me? So when I was vegetarian, I was eating mostly fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes. I had soy milk and instead of dairy. So it was really the occasional, you know, bit of egg or, or cheese or if I was eating out, you know, um, wouldn't have been vegan, would have been vegetarian. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, I lost yeah, my right. train of thought there. That's all right. Um, right. Yeah, I just I just sort of said, okay, well, I'm, you know, practically doing it anyway. So, I'll try yeah. it and see. Yeah. And if it's too hard, I'll stop because I didn't really know. I think I knew one other person that was vegan and I thought, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be really tough. And, and it wasn't, and I did feel I felt really good. I felt I felt, um, yeah, just felt it really nice, kind of, yep. kind of knowing um, that I, well, I wasn't contributing to any any of the, you know, sort of processes that that I didn't agree with in terms yep. of the way that animals were treated, and um, yeah, and I felt. I felt good and I, I loved cooking. So I was discovering all kinds of new recipes and doing lots of baking for my friends to convince them yeah. of how great it was to be <laughs> vegan and it was just as easy as, you know, as anything else. And and so I actually got, I got more excited about food when I made that switch just because I was doing something a little bit different. I think it made me uh, more adventurous. Hmm. That, that's something I think that people are often surprised by too. Uh, which I say the same thing, you know, when I went vegan, I did it for ethics and it felt like it was going to be a big sacrifice, yeah. but it ended up being the opposite. Yeah. That I ended up trying uh, so many more foods that I'd never had before and eating so many from so many different kind of cultures and cuisines and trying all these ingredients that I never would have tried yeah. before. You know, I was meat and three veg and that, <laughs> that was that. And, you know, food was, it did the opposite. It was the opposite of boring. It, food got much more interesting. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was, that was a cool very cool experience for me and uh, you know, maybe more people would uh, give it a try if they, if they understood that how interesting it was going to be. Um, so it sounds like you were like a pretty healthy eater from the beginning. You know, as a vegetarian, you said you mostly ate fruits and vegetables and whole grains and things like that anyway. So you're, were you all, were you, how was your health? Were you already pretty healthy as well or...? Uh, I think I was. Yeah. I was really active. I played a lot of sports when I was a kid. Yeah. So I, I was playing netball and cricket and, you know, sometimes I had training three or four times a week. Um, I did find that I had to be conscious to eat more when I was trying to eat healthily, which is interestingly enough, something people will tell you when you switch to a whole food plant-based diet is that you have to make sure you're getting in, yeah. you know, enough if, if you have those higher energy needs, you need to make sure that you're, you know, taking in enough food and eating enough volume. So that was a bit of an adjustment because when you're a kid, when you're young and you eat quite calorie rich foods, you can, you can sort of not quite understand um, the changes you need to make if you are going to start to try to eat more healthily. So that, yeah. that, took, a, that took a little bit of you know, fine tuning over the years. And interestingly enough, when I switched from vegetarian to vegan, I actually started eating less healthily oh, yeah. because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it was vegan, then I wanted to try it. And whether yeah. that meant it was, you know, uh, ice cream or donut or mock meat or, yeah. or something. So I did that for a few years and, and then went back to eating more the way that I did before because I realized how much better I felt when I, when I stuck with those foods that were sort of more nat, what I what I used to say was foods that are naturally vegan, foods yeah. that aren't made to be vegan, foods yeah, that's that just a, happen yeah. to be. It's a good way to look yeah. at it. I, I sort of had a similar experience because when I first went vegan, uh, without knowing it, I was eating whole food plant based, 
I was because yeah. I what do I eat when I'm a vegan? I don't know. I didn't really do much research on what to eat. I just knew I didn't want to eat animals anymore. So yep. <laughs> I, uh, I, what does that leave me with? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I'm going to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and things like that. And I think in the first month I lost a fair bit of weight. I can't remember exactly how much, but I lost weight and I felt great. And then I started discovering all the vegan junk food. I was like, oh, great. This ice cream is vegan. I'm yes. going to eat all of it. Exactly. <laughs> Wouldn't have done it before I was vegan, but now that I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, these, these a vegan cookie. I'll give me 10 of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so. it's not to say it's not, it's not good that those, you know, um, that, that market is expanding and people are becoming more aware of, of those course. sorts of things. But I think that it can... Yeah, it can it can be um, detrimental for some for some people, and yeah. definitely in terms of health, it can it can turn into a bit of an issue. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, from an ethical point of view, those things are good, mm-hmm. you know, because you can have ice cream without having to, um, you know, be involved in the dairy industry. But uh, you know, if you want to be healthy, you know, probably vegan ice cream is probably healthier than it's a step. Yeah, I'd say vegan <laughs> ice cream is healthier than dairy ice cream. But that doesn't make it healthy. <laughs> That's correct, and yeah. and like you said, it's a step. So you, it, there are people who I know that that having sort of things that you can see as transitional foods mm. have helped them to get to uh, the point where they are eating much better. Yeah. But on like as you said, it's someone like you where it's um, all or nothing. You know, those those can actually be roadblocks. So it's really different, really different for different people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I knew about what I know now about health, if I had have known that then, um, I probably would have never got to the point where I wanted to do a year of only potatoes and quit all food and, yeah. you know, all that sort of stuff because I would have, you know, that first month I would have understood what was happening and uh, in my head I'd lost weight and got healthier, a little bit of weight and got a bit healthier because I went vegan. Yes. So that meant everything that vegan was okay. It was totally fine. Yeah, but that, that was the way it was. I didn't understand what was going on and, uh, you know, if yeah, in hindsight would have been nice, but whatever. We live and we learn. We move on. But here we are then, and That's then it. we might not have been doing exactly. This, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, so w- let's let's get on to more the your what you do and uh, and your website and your recommendations for people. How how is it that you recommend people eat? Oh, look, I don't want to be too specific yeah. i think i I'll keep it broad as yeah. you like yeah um you know like we've already said i think i think the focus should be um you know if you're eating a plant-based diet the focus should be on those those foods that are going to be health promoting so fruits vegetables whole grains and legumes as your focus with yep. with uh um other things added in to help you actually make meals to help you actually um make the food taste yep. taste good think you know herbs and spices and some condiments and nuts and seeds if if you don't have a weight problem or a or a cardi you know an issue with cardiovascular disease yep. um can we talk about that a little bit more like why what's wrong with nuts and seeds if you've got a weight problem or a heart problem well look i'm just following the advice of yep. of the people who are more informed um, yeah. than i am which is yeah, that yeah. um you know, if you look at a lot of the studies and particularly the work of Dr. Esselstyn, um, you know, there's there's proof from the work that they have done that um, fats in any form can actually contribute to the um, to the progression of cardiovascular disease. So people who yep. already have developed uh, problems, it can it can you know even the fats we sort of see as healthy fats, fats that are contained in whole plant foods, can be a problem for them and also a problem for people who are trying to lose weight just because the the calorie density is so much higher than it is in in more carbohydrate rich foods yeah um so i mean that's something i include a bit of because neither of those things are a problem for yeah. me but even i know that that it's very easy to get carried away with the foods that that are higher in calorie density so mm. keeping the focus on you know those four other groups i think is you know if if the most of what you're eating is those four things the fruits vegetables whole grains and legumes i think that's really it, it's that i don't want to say it's that simple but i like to simplify it to that if that's yeah. where what well, most of the food on your plate is at every meal i think you're doing I yeah think you're doing pretty well i'd agree with that too and i i, I avoid nuts and 
and uh, seeds and things like and avocados yeah. as well. Uh, yeah, because weight is an issue for me. So uh, yeah, and, and sort of the, the higher calorie density uh, food that you eat makes it more likely to then start triggering the uh, pleasure centers of your brain and yes. make them addictive and things like that as well. So Even I try to avoid them as sort of snacks in yep. and of themselves. We might add a little bit to a meal, to a salad, but Make like a satay or something. Yeah, yep. you know, toast up some, some flaked almonds and put yep. them or sunflower seeds and put them on a salad. But as you said, you know, you, you have to know yourself. Yeah. And I know if I have a bag of cashews in the drawer, they're going to disappear in the middle of the night. So yeah. you just sort of have to, you have to learn a little bit about yourself and what's good, yeah. what, what works for you and what doesn't work yeah, for definitely. you. Yeah, um, definitely. So there's always, I, I guess you talk to a lot of people about making changes to diets and stuff and there's always, uh, people always have their own roadblocks and things yeah. that get in the way of making changes. So what are some of the things that come up in, for you, when you're talking to others, what do people say gets in the way? What questions do they have? Oh, social situations are a really big one. People struggle when they're, you know, they, they are used to eating out or going to their friends' houses a lot to eat and they find that they can't get, um, they can't, it's difficult for them to eat, eat the foods that they want to be able to eat, in particular um, with oil. Because of course, mm. it's recommend that one of the big recommendations in the whole food plant based diet is to um, avoid oils. And of course, when you're eating out or even eating with friends, that's one of the the most difficult things to avoid. So, people people are often asking, you know, a, about that because then they they know what they want to do, they know what they should do, but then you're in these situations where the food's just kind of there, and you don't want to be the odd one out and you don't want to be difficult and I, I experienced that myself yeah. as well. That's a really, really hard one. Um, so, and just just changing habits, you know, just changing the things that you've been doing and the way that you've been eating for possibly decades and decades. Um, so, just getting yourself in the habit of doing things differently, you know, getting yourself in the habit of cooking, preparing your meals, getting yourself in the habit of not grabbing stuff and just kind of you know eating whatever you feel like eating whenever you feel like yeah. eating it i think is a that that in its in and of itself is is a difficult thing for people to um for some people to to um to change yeah. you know if you're used to just eating on the go or or grabbing a chocolate bar or having a packet of chips and you know you switch over because you think okay well this will be really good for my health or this will help me lose weight um it's a big adjustment. Yeah. So that's, that's what I, that's what I hear. I probably hear about the most. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, how, how do you guide people through those things then? I, I, I'm a big, uh, believer that you need to always be prepared. Yes. Basically that I have this, well, not my saying, it's lots of people saying prior prepara- preparation prevents poor performance. Yeah. Did I say that right? Tongue twister. Um, so yeah, is that, are you along the same lines as, is that or that is one of the the main things I always te- tell people is yeah. it's just being prepared is one of the most uh, one of the most vital things. So you yeah. just have to get yourself in the habit um, of being prepared. You know, in different situations, whether that's you cook up a bunch of potatoes and you have them in the fridge, so that if you have to run out and you might be out the whole day, you have them ready. You're not going to be tempted by by things that are that are out there when you're out you know that you might get stuck somewhere and you're starving and you, there's really nothing that's going to be good for you well then it doesn't it doesn't matter because you have the backup you're going to be yeah you're going to be less tempted um and even at home just having your fridge and your and your cupboards stocked with lots and lots of healthy food and 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 having meals prepared having meals in the freezer having vegetables cut up in the fridge they just get you in the habit of making healthier choices so it does require forethought and planning but it it's not that difficult if you um if if you yeah just basically get yourself in the habit of it and force yourself to sort of find windows where you can can do the preparation i I think in the end you probably end up saving time yeah when you're prepared like that because you can absolutely you can get enough food to make a huge pot of whatever it is and uh and then you can put it in the freezer and you've got food for a week yep 
and uh, and then you don't have to cook for a week and it's that's, great. And that's one of the things I like yeah. to do, <laughs> definitely. If, you, if you're like me and don't mind eating the same thing every day, then just you can make a week of food on Sunday and just eat it for the week. I've, and then, I've yeah. definitely <laughs> been known to do that and yeah, I'm yeah. the same way. I don't mind. Yeah. I don't mind the repetition and I think that, that, I think again, that's another thing that I tell people that maybe they need to, and I, I think a lot of people are never able to do it, but I think if you if you do become comfortable with eating a little bit more simply and eating, you know, some, you, like you said, repeating meals, um, I think that will make things easier in yeah. the beginning as well. Yeah, and um, yeah, just the simplest thing of all when you're out as well, when people often say, you know, what if you're out and there's nothing you can eat? And I don't know about uh, Antwerp, but uh, in, in Melbourne, there's you're never far away from uh, a shopping center or a, um, a, a fruit and veg shop where you can just go and buy some fruit and just eat it. Like it's the fastest food there is. And you, you are know? you are <laughs> spoilt for choice in Melbourne yeah. because even beyond fruit, there's there's still you know a few good options for yeah. for grab and go. Definitely bit less in Antwerp I think yeah, than okay. Melbourne. <laughs> uh, yeah. but I do the same thing you yeah. know get an apple get a banana get yeah. a, get a packet of cherry tomatoes and yeah. tie yourself over till you can find something a little bit more substantial if you need it yeah good advice uh, so I'm sure you're all uh, we've got I to just go said tie yourself over instead of tired well that's, you are jet lag that's how tired I am <laughs> sorry <laughs> um I'm sure you get all of these questions and uh, I, I'm sure they get a bit boring, but we have to go through them anyway. Uh, when, you, when you're eating whole food plant-based, you get all these uh, concerns about uh, from other people that want to make the change or family and friends that are concerned about you. The fir- I'm sure you know what's coming. Where do you get your protein? Yes, the big question. <laughs> I think that I don't get asked that very often anymore um, because... I think people know how annoyed I'll get. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that, that my mum gets asked when she tells people as well, but she's she even even she's really good at, at answering that question now. Is she whole food plant-based as well? She is most of the time. Um, good. Definitely moved more and more and more over to that way of eating and, and um, really influenced a lot of other people as well because she's lost weight and lowered her blood pressure. So nice. that's been fantastic for her. So she's, yeah, she's good at fielding questions now <laughs> too. Or she just says, just write to Emma and she'll, <laughs> she'll tell you. And it's, it's, um, it's interesting that people are so hung up on that. And I've noticed since I've been in Australia, just this insane... Sorry, that's a bit rude, but that's, that's okay. how I feel it is. This insane focus on protein as, you know, as just uh, Even everything. to the point where we don't even call meat meat anymore. We call no, it protein. It's protein. Even though there are other components to it. High protein <laughs> ice cream and high protein. High pro- I haven't seen oh, that. Oh, yeah. Found <laughs> that. I did a little explore in the supermarket yeah, yesterday. Right. I high like protein ice cream. I was, yeah, it just I was just baffled and I saw it again waiting at the tram stop today, you know, super loaded protein milk, which was supposed to be comparable to eating a steak. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, you know, <laughs> but I don't, yeah, and so and so I, I often explain, oft, often my, what I do is when people say, oh, where do you get your protein? Um, just say, oh, well, how much protein do I need? Yeah. And they sort of stop and go... Well, I don't really know. And that's yeah. kind of the answer because people seem to be quite focused on it as a, you know, as as something that's extremely important, but they don't actually know what our requirement is. And based on what people are eating, I they seem to think it's three or four or five or six times what we actually need. So I often just say to people, look, if you're eating enough calories uh, to meet your needs, there's very little chance that you're not eating enough protein because i mean how many how many people do you know who are protein deficient mm. you, know, you might meet someone who's iron deficient you might meet someone who's vitamin d deficient but protein deficiency isn't something that we see and as soon as you explain it to some people they go wow i just never i just never knew that yeah <laughs> i just did not know <laughs> that we didn't need we didn't need that much yeah well, that's okay for you though but i need protein yeah i'm different Yes, I start to feel really weak and shaky yeah. if I don't have protein. Yeah, um, yeah. and and of course, if, if you know, I, I, I understand that it, it could be a little d- different for athletes depending on what kind of activity they're doing, but it seems to me that even some people who think that they 
they're going to the gym once or twice a week that suddenly they need 10 times more protein than the average person, which again, doesn't. You need to drink protein at every opportunity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Get it in every way that you can. <laughs> and you so need it in your ice cream now too. Apparently, apparently. you need yeah. it in your ice cream because <laughs> if you're going to need more protein, that's yeah. where you really should uh, be getting it. Ice cream's a health food now. As long as you mix some protein powder in with it, it's healthy. Healthy. <laughs> um, okay, next one the, is the uh, the probably a similar answer, I'd imagine, but let's ask it anyway. Where, where, what about calcium? What about calcium? <laughs> yeah, that one's not quite as straightforward to answer because... Um, I mean, yeah, people have the, the, again, it's a bit like protein. You don't call meat, meat anymore. You call it protein. Well, it's a bit like calcium, you know, it's dairy. That's Mm. what calcium is to a lot of people. Um, and what's interesting and something that I know a lot of people in the plant-based community know is, um, your don't quote me cause I'm not, you know, I'm not an ex, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a dietitian. (laughs) But just having... Well, you're allowed to talk about it. I can talk about these things, I hope. Um, Reading, you know, a few things from the World Health Organization and a couple of other places that seem to indicate that uh, your calcium, your daily calcium requirement actually goes down um, if you're not eating animal product and you're eating less sodium because your calcium output is lower. This oh. is my understanding. There could be people listening that yeah, <laughs> understand it a lot better than I do. I'm sure there are. That's not, I haven't, I didn't know that. So well, Yeah, so yeah, if that, you, if you cool. have a look at some of the documents and their recommendations on calcium, they'll actually put it down for people that aren't eating animal protein and then down lower still for people that are consuming a low sodium diet, which if you're eating whole foods plant-based is exactly what you're doing. So, um, well, it makes sense to me because you know, go, go, I always go back to my potato thing, but calcium was one of the nutrients that wasn't quite uh, high, enough. high enough according to the the mainstream uh daily requirements uh, i was getting about half of what i was supposed to last year uh and i i knew that would be okay because it had been so, done so many times before and i wasn't worried about it but it was interesting uh that my my bone density and um, bone weight of my bones I got scanned through the year and it actually went up slightly over wow. the course of the year and um, yeah I didn't really understand why or how but I just knew that I'd be okay because so many people you know the entire Irish population had been okay doing it so I thought I'd be okay but uh, yeah that, that's an interesting explanation of why perhaps uh, having about half the calcium intake was okay because my body just didn't need as much yeah because of yeah what you what you explained i think yeah i think that the again i could be wrong but i think it's a thousand it's about a thousand milligrams a day and and then yeah your half would be sort of 500 and i think some of the documentation that i was referring to earlier talks about a level of you know four to six hundred being normal for for some populations depending on their diet and, and where they're located. So yeah, and that those, those populations tend to have less osteoporosis and yes. bone problems. Interestingly and like enough, that. Yeah. in the, in the uh, you know, uh, Sweden and Norway and where, where dairy consumption is the highest, you also have very, very high rates of osteoporosis and hip fractures. Of mm. course, being that far from the equator, um, being in the, the darker, colder climates could have, you know, there's an association there as well but it is it is interesting but if in terms of you know plant foods that do contain calcium there are obviously aside from potatoes which seemed to do a good enough job for yeah. you <laughs> um if people are concerned you know eating making sure you eat lots of leafy green vegetables that's gonna that's really gonna help you get a lot of that's gonna answer a lot of questions to do with minerals iron and yeah all iron sorts and of calcium things, yeah. and, and all those sorts of things and um And yeah, beyond that, you know, legumes, whole grains, um, some nuts and seeds, they've all got trace amounts that if you're eating, if you're eating enough food, you know, if you're eating a good varied diet, if you're, you know, just, just putting a little bit of, of effort into making sure that you're, that you're eating well, I think that for, um, from what I've seen or what I've heard of what I've read, um, just another thing that, that we don't need to be so deeply concerned about yeah yeah i've spent uh, quite a lot of time searching and i haven't been able to find any documented evidence of someone with a calcium deficiency who was eating enough calories from 
uh, plant foods. Yeah. So that was uh, when I read that, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to be fine. Comforting. No, yeah, well, Very I didn't comforting. Actually, sorry, I shouldn't say when I read that, when I didn't read it because I couldn't find anything. To, <laughs> you know, but I, I just, just spent a long time. But, and there I was must, like, you thought there must I just, be yeah, something. Yeah, I just can't find any evidence that I'm going to have a problem. Yeah. You know, so anyway. Uh, so the last uh, interesting question about whole food plant based, you know, that's these are the those two questions: the protein, and the calcium. They're just the general vegan questions. But when you go whole food plant based, then suddenly everyone's concerned about the oil. Where are you going to get your good, healthy fats from? You know, you need olive oil in your diet. It has to be there. Yes. So what? What's? How do you answer that one? Yes, it's interesting that I'd never heard of this olive oil deficiency and still <laughs> until I started telling people that I didn't cook with it. Um, yeah, I think I, I'm, not quite, I'm not sure about that one because it's pretty logical to me that if, you know, if all you're doing is taking the pure refined oils out of your diet, um, I, I don't quite understand how you could see that as a problem in and of itself. I can understand how some people might have a concern if you're completely restricting all and any fats um, I can understand that for some people that that would raise questions because, of, of course, a lot of people are told about the importance of fats for brain health and for other bodily functions. How, you know, again, it's one of those things that I think people think we need a lot more of mm. than we actually do. But, you know, I sort of compare eating pure oils to eating pure sugars. Well, you know, if I completely stopped eating fruit um, or completely stopped eating anything you know, fruit or carbohydrates or anything with natural sugar in it, um, people could ask me questions. But if I yep. just stop eating table sugar, is anyone going to be concerned yeah. about my health? No. Well, it's a little bit the same for me with oil. It's the, you know, pure extracted oil from a whole plant food, which does have fiber and vitamins and minerals and nutrients. I, I just don't see how you would think that something terrible would go wrong mm. if you're just doing that yeah, that's a actually a really good comparison that you've made between table sugar and oil most really people just won't thing, see yeah. it like that yeah yeah it's like sugar is something that is high in and concentrated in calories and it used to be a part of a whole plant yes and oil is the same it's very high in concentrated calories not much other nutrition and it used to be a part of a plant right? exactly and we we view them so differently so differently yeah. <laughs> quite for, so far removed from their natural state and maybe it's because they've been a part of some cultures for a very long time you know they've they've been they have been a part of you know some mediterranean cultures i can't say mm. for how long but you know it's it's just something that people are used to having in the diet and and um it's it's part of the foundation of cooking where you're sauteing things in oil or you're frying things in oil that it's hard for people to wrap their head around how just how you would eat without you know without yeah. that without that there to sort of start you off yeah well how do you then water water's a magical thing i don't de i don't fry anything in water that doesn't end well <laughs> <laughs> but you know we, you have different techniques for doing things if we're just doing our onion and garlic we usually use vegetable broth oh, yeah. um or veggie stock you know homemade or something that's low sodium and that's really great for adding flavor and if you cook it down for long enough you get really nice caramelization um baking you know we just bake things in the oven on baking paper non-stick baking paper and and it's just amazing how how for some people it's an adjustment in the beginning but it's something you get used to so fast you know um it 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 really it's it's that easy and baking even yeah. baking um certain things a little bit more difficult but you know if you want to make cookies or cakes or muffins you can use mashed banana you can use applesauce you can use um, pureed tofu. There's all kinds of things that you can oh, do I've to replace of, I haven't heard of pureed tofu. I've yeah. heard of the others, but yeah. Worth Sometimes a try. good for different recipes. So, yeah, okay. um, yeah, people are just amazed when they do it. They think, oh God, why did I, you know, why did I think this was so hard? It's really easy. I wish I'd been doing this all the, you yeah. know, the whole time. I didn't, didn't realize I could save myself, you know, the extra, the extra unnecessary, uh, unnecessary fat and calories. Yeah 
just by using a little bit of water instead. Yeah, well, talking about the extra unnecessary fat, a, a good segue into uh, I read a nice article on your on your website a while ago about calorie density. Yeah. So what is what is calorie density? That's probably a foreign concept to lots of people. So how how do you explain that situation? Um, I think it's been a while since I read that article, <laughs> so I should have I should have. Uh, done a refresher but that's all right no. it's um yeah it's basically the, this is the updated version then we're yeah, doing the, right uh, now the updated <laughs> jet lagged version yeah <laughs> um you know basically different foods um the calorie density is the amount of calories that they have per 100 grams or per pound or per, per kilo so at the lower the lowest end of that you have vegetables green you know mostly green red and yellow vegetables things like leafy greens and well everything carrots um yep. capsicums lettuce all that sort of stuff is really low in calorie Non-starchy density. vegetables. Non-starchy, yep. that's a much yep. better term. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I was trying to think of. Um, you know, at two to 300 calories per pound, which if, you know, we don't use pounds, but, you know. It's all, all the literature you read tends to be... I know, everything comes tends from the to be US, American. Yeah. So we could do kilos, just double it. You yeah. know, we'll just say double. Just yeah. double everything. Um, and then you have fruits, you know, that are a little bit higher again. Um, fresh fruits, you know. Uh, things like apples and pears and oranges. Of course, there's like, you know, there's little variations. Bananas have more calories than than berries do yeah. and, and and things like that. They're, in, the they're in a Similar window, ballpark. you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then, um, then you have your legumes and whole grains. So intact whole grains, things that haven't been ground up or processed very far. So things like uh, brown rice, things like um, things like oat, oat groats, whole oats, um, buckwheat um millet you know things that are whole grains they they'll have i think whole grains and legumes around five to six hundred calories per pound and it goes upwards from there so those are the four food groups that i mentioned before and interestingly enough those are you know the four groups that are the lowest calorie density so for people who are looking to lose weight or who um you know, have struggled with their weight and want to maintain it without obsessing over, you know, how much of something they can eat or weighing or measuring their food. Generally speaking, if you're eating below that line, if you're only eating foods that are 600 calories per pound or less, it's going to be quite difficult to to overeat because the volume of food that you have to eat um, to fill your stomach is only going to be a certain amount of calories. Now, once you get higher, even once you get to things like bread, even 100% wholemeal breads and pasta, or I actually think pasta is lower. I think pasta is yep. still down there because of the water that it absorbs. Uh, okay. But things like um, uh, crackers and whole grain crackers and whole grain breads and things like that, you get higher still. So they could be sort of 1,000 to 1,200 calories oh, per pound. High. So we're already wow. talking double. So if you if you swap out, you know, an equal weight of brown rice for bread. Um, not to say it's bad for everybody, you know, if, if you don't have an issue with, mm. uh, with, with your weight or with overeating. Um, you might not notice it. You might not notice it in your stomach because it's taking up the same volume in terms of space or weight, but it's double... It's double the calories. Yeah, right. I had no idea it was... I should have looked into this more, I guess, but... Uh, I hope I'm right. I hope yeah. <laughs> no, I overshot it. And no. obviously, again, it's 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 a window. There are ones that are going to be yeah, less yeah. and there's ones that are going to be more. And and once you go... I don't up, eat a lot of bread, but I do eat a little bit of bread these days. It's tough Whole when you live in Belgium to avoid the yeah. bread. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, and, and, it, and, and then it gets higher still. So you get to, uh, you know dried fruits and then once you get up to you know nuts and avocados uh, and the higher fat foods because fat has nine calories per gram the calorie density is you know and especially once you get up to oil is three to four times that of the stuff that we were Mm. talking about eating before so the more and more and more of those foods that you include in your diet the higher in calorie density it becomes so you can be eating the set what looks to be the same amount of food but actually you could be eating hundreds of more calories a yeah. day some people need that um but a lot of people don't yeah most people don't most so, people yeah. probably in this day and age yeah. um don't need that and so it's kind of the applying the principle of calorie density is really handy for some people who want to lose weight because counting calories is you know it's a well 
think it's a pain in the butt. Yeah, I can I've imagine tried it that. would be. <laughs> I've tried um, that a lot, a lots of times. Yeah, you know, because it's just not really a natural thing. You know, yeah. you sort of want to eat till you're full, and so if you do eat low calorie density foods, you can't just eat fruit and vegetables because they're not going to satiate you. Yeah. They're not going to. They might fill your belly up, but they're not going to get to those receptors that say, "Okay, I've had enough." food i've had enough fuel to keep me going so once you add in the the legumes and the whole grains you know you you're talking about food that that uh or a meal you know combining combining those elements that does both those things yeah. fills your belly up makes your body feel like you know you've got an, you do have enough calories to sort of keep going but um without really letting you overdo it in terms of in terms of calories yeah they're they're the ultimate in comfort foods in my opinion yes they're they're just you know potatoes especially obviously i like you know people call potatoes comfort food and of course they are they They, are they fill you up and they make you feel great well what could be better (laughs) but they make you fat didn't you oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah well i'm working on that i'm trying to find a way to get fat on potatoes i haven't found it but you must be an anomaly (laughs) oh yeah it's just me just just you (laughs) so uh all this uh all this experience and all this work that you've done with your website and everything it it eventually led you to writing some books it did uh, and I really like the idea of the books because, you know, so often you hear that oh, I'd, I'd like to eat whole food plant based or I'd like to eat vegan or whatever, but I just can't afford it. That's only for, you know, the upper end of town. That's, um, you know, the average Joe just can't can't do that. Yeah. So that's why that's what I love about these books. So can you tell us a little bit more about them? Was, was that part of your reason for writing them or? That was my whole reason. <clears throat> well, that was, yeah, almost the entire reason for writing them because... Oh, sorry, I should, sorry to interrupt, but I should say they're called <laughs> Whole Food Plant Based on $5 a day. Yes, so, it's a mouthful. Yeah. Is that I'm, on Amazon or just on your website? No, it's just on... Um, they're available through Payhip, payhip.com. Oh, it's a, it's an e-book, okay. yeah, an okay. e-book hosting website and and um, they're both on there. But if you go to plantplate.com, you'll find the links to both of them. Yep there as well it's a long title but i really just wanted to say exactly what it was about because even if you say on a budget well what's a budget yeah. you know to some people a budget is only spending 15 dollars a day on food to some people it's four yeah. you know so i thought okay i'll be <laughs> as specific as possible <laughs> so people can know exactly what they're in for and um yeah that's why i did it because um I would see it the more that I got involved in in learning about plant-based nutrition the more I became integrated into these online communities where I could see what people were saying and what they were writing and how they were feeling it was common oh yeah I'd love to do this but you know I I'm a single parent or I'd love to do this but I'm studying I'd love to do this but I'm on a on a low pension you know so I just can't afford I just can't afford to eat this way. It's too Mm. expensive for me. And I understood where people were coming from because if you do walk down the produce aisles, you know, fruit and veggies, it can can look expensive if you're focused on that. And likewise, if you're looking at those um, vegan substitutes for animal-based alternatives, if you're looking at the fake meats and the vegan cheeses and the vegan ice creams, all that also looks incredibly expensive. Um, but I knew that it wasn't um, yeah. for a fact that it wasn't because I'd eaten this way for quite a while and I'd eaten this way while I was uh, young, you know, living out of home for the first time, uh, making next to no money, trying to save to travel and I was eating that way. I was living in the UK at the time where I first really tried a whole food plant-based diet and 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 doing it on a budget and I was spending 16 pounds a week on food. Right. Yeah, for the whole That's week. good guy. And not like bird, f- like, you know, little tiny me- meager amounts of food, like proper, proper meals, you yeah. know, enough to really fill me up and keep me going for the whole day because I was working quite a lot. Um, and yeah, so for years I was living on a budget for different reasons, moved overseas and, you know, a little bit difficult to find a job sometimes and adjusting to new circumstances. And, um, yeah, I just, I just knew it could be done because I was doing it and I had done it and I just thought oh, people really need to know that it's possible because a lot of the people that can benefit the most um, in, in, term, in health terms from a whole food plant-based diet 
are people that possibly don't have, you know, a high income, are people who, um, you know, uh, d- you know, don't have uh, as much money to pay the medical bills to 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 pay for their uh, for the drugs, you know, to treat diabetes or or heart disease. So, I really wanted those people to to know or to feel that they were able to do it and that it that it wasn't unattainable. So I just thought, okay, well, I'll I'll show other people that it can be done, and I'll show them just how how cheap you know mm. it can be done for. Uh, I think it's a really important conversation to have because when when definitely in melbourne and i know from a couple of trips going to the u.s um lately and it's probably the same in europe as well i guess that when you get to the the lower socioeconomic areas where the household incomes are lower then that's where there are more mcdonald's and hungry jacks burger king all those sorts of things and people are on low incomes and they just want to they just want to feed their family for cheap and these fast food restaurants make it seem like they're a cheap option yes. when uh, you know when in reality you could probably feed your whole family for a day for what it costs to get one meal there and and also you know like you said the medical costs yes. that, that come with eating those foods are huge so you're saving in two ways there so yeah, I think it's really important to have that conversation, and it's and books like yours are important to, that they exist to help people help people through it as well. But you know, I'm imagining general public. Oh well, okay, five dollars a day is good, but I want to eat more than just oats and rice. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is it? How do we do it? Because you know, obviously, oats and rice are cheap. Yes, and, they are. But you can't just and, cook up a bowl of them and eat them every meal. I think most people wouldn't find that very yeah, <laughs> exciting. Yeah. So what sort of what are, what are some tips that you've got from Look, that for that point of view then? Uh, it really comes down to planning, yeah. You know, and that's that's why I wrote the books because the planning part is the difficult part, and I knew how to do it because I'd been doing it for years and years and years. But I could only imagine how hard that task would be for somebody who was just trying to come from you know an omnivorous or even a junk food diet onto a whole food plant based diet. It's it's an overwhelming amount of information and and learning you know what can I buy what meals are suitable um, you know what ingredients are okay so um, I wanted to do the planning for people to show them how to do it so um, you know you do have to you do have to plan ahead and say okay well what am I going to use to make my meals you can't just go out and buy a bunch of cheap ingredients and then just make meals for them because like you said just oats and lentils and and rice alone aren't really going to make a meal they're you know if, <laughs> it's gonna yeah. be there was a time in uh in my uni days where i i was struggling and uh and had the odd meal that was just white rice and tomato sauce yes and but you I, are not alone there <laughs> and that's pretty cheap but you know like i said that's not going to cut it and it's not exactly <laughs> health promoting i think yeah, after yeah. a few days of eating like yeah, that yeah um, so it's, it's planning. So I, I made the books as a plan, as a whole plan with telling people how to shop and planning the meals and using up all of the ingredients so that, that people could learn and see how to do it. So what you kind of do is you plan what pantry staples you need. So you need some herbs and spices to flavor your meals and you not, you might need a few condiments or, you know, um, some dried fruits or something to add flavor to your meals. And then each week make a menu plan. And say, okay, well, I'm going to make these four or five recipes. And like you said, with repetition, you know, you don't cook something new every day when you're eating on a budget. You might cook big, big batches of three or four or five things and you'll have them for lunch and dinner. And that's, that's what saves you money. So I was kind of showing people um, how to do that, you know, Um, using a lot of the same ingredients, but making different meals, you know, different flavor profiles. So you might use beans and rice to make a Mexican chili and then another night you use them to make an Indian curry uh, or use them to make burgers, you know. So showing people that how, how to utilise these inexpensive ingredients um, in different ways, using different flavours to create different meals that aren't, you know, really boring. Mm. <laughs> because <laughs> you could, I could have said to people, you know, here's, here's what you can buy or here are the recipes, but if you went to make 
14 different recipes in a week, well, it wouldn't cost $5 a day yeah. because you're buying too many different ingredients. So it really just does come down to planning and, um, and learning, you know, what kind of meals can be done the cheapest. And, you know, that means sometimes, you know, a bit more of maybe frozen veg and a bit more of legumes and rice and less of, you know, quinoa and organic kale, you know, stuff yeah. like that. So it's... Um, yeah, it's just it's just learning and planning. That's yeah. really what it comes down to. Cool. And um, what about the, the organic side of things? Then I, I was going to ask about that anyway. But since you brought up organic kale, like I, I get a lot of people that say, "Oh, you know, I want to I want to go whole food, plant based, or I want to go vegan, but I can't afford organic." Yeah. Um, but um, what are your thoughts on that? I can tell you my thoughts, but this is your. I was about I to start. I feel like maybe to, yeah. my thoughts are 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 in line with yours. Yeah. I was going to start the answering look. the question, but I've realised that this is I'm interviewing you, That's not the other right. way around. That's all right. I don't mind. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually went out. Uh, I was conscious of of making a page explaining that in the book, so it's actually in the appendix in each of the books because it is important to a lot of people, and I think from an environmental perspective and and maybe in some ways from a health perspective, um, it's important to some people, and some people don't see the point in even eating whole food plant-based unless you're doing it organically. But I think it's an unnecessary roadblock if it's not within your means. If it is, that's great. If it's important to you and you you can afford to buy organic ingredients, I think that's really fantastic. But if you can't, don't let it stop you from eating this way because the benefits that you're going to get just from switching to a whole food plant-based diet if it's in my, this is again, this is yeah. my opinion, um, you know, conventionally grown foods is going to be enormous. You know, someone switching from, you know, meat and three veg or the fa- you know, the family living on a low income eating, eating, you know, fried foods and, and McDonald's and, you know, bags of frozen unexplainable stuff. <laughs> um, you know, switching over to, you know, conventional broccoli and, and, and oats and brown rice and bananas i mean it's it's a no-brainer it's it's that much healthier that 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 people shouldn't need to stress about whether or not it's organic if it's not possible for them so that's what i explained in the book because i know from having lived on you know um a low food budget for quite a long time it it just wasn't possible you know i just couldn't justify spending three to four times as much i just could i didn't have you know if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. So just do what you can with what you've got, basically. That's yeah. my principle. <laughs> yeah, I like I like that too. That's pretty much along the lines that I do. I, I would prefer to eat organic, but most of the time I just can't afford it. That's no, just, exactly. That's just the, if, I, if I pick um, something up and it's it's with, pro, with, with stuff from your cupboard, I think it's a little bit more reasonable. But mm. definitely when you're going through... Um, the fruit and veggie aisles certain, some things are close in price and I always try to buy those so things mm. like um, you know I buy onions and carrots and uh, beetroot and stuff like that organic because the price is pretty similar but sometimes you pick something up and it's four or five times the price and I just it's not it's not a choice for some people that's what's important to remember for some people it's not a choice of organic or not it's a choice of um, you know having that food or having crap basically yeah. you know having a conventionally grown banana or having you know 20 cent potato chips so yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and like I'm, I'm a big fan of um of mandarins at the moment they're delicious oh, at the moment so good and i went to the shop just yesterday to buy some and uh, right next to each other there's um conventionally grown mandarins which are delicious and still healthy and they were i think three dollars 90 for a kilo and next to them were organic um, mandarins and they looked pretty similar but you know they probably taste pretty similar too and uh and pretty similar for your health but they were i think they were 12 or 13 dollars a kilo can be a massive i was like difference. you know i'm on a budget too i'm not i'm not t- as tight as i was when i was at uni but <laughs> you know i'm on a budget and i'm like i just i can't justify that and in the end i, I look at it as though there are two reasons people eat organic one is they think it's healthier and, and it probably is. But from, from from a health point of view, I think you're probably talking about the difference between an, an A and an A+. Plus. Yeah. You know, you want an A+, plus, but if you can't get an A+, plus, an A is pretty good. Yep. Let's just go for an A. And um, 
And and from an environmental point of view, maybe you're talking about the difference between an A and a B. And you know, it's that's depending on depending, depending on the food, yeah. yeah. It, you know. So it will yeah, exactly. Yeah, depending on the food, or maybe an A, a plus and an A minus or something. I don't know. But anyway, the point is that it's still pretty good when you compare it to, you know, all the all the other crap that a lot of people eat, like you know. And the effect, you yeah. know, the environmental impact yeah. of animal agriculture yeah, in particular. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if you want to, um, if you want to do good thing, like you know, if you can't afford to go all the way to organic, then get close. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> don't, yeah, that's that's really yeah. the the main point to yeah. drive home. Don't let that stop you. Yeah. You know, don't think that if you're not doing it the hundred percent A plus perfect way that there's that yeah. you shouldn't do it at all. You yeah. Know, there yeah. is there is room in between there. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. All right. So we're we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap this up soon. Uh but before we before we do, I wanted to know what's a what's a typical day of eating involved for you? Um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty consistent. Um, not so much when I'm traveling, but as I am at the That's moment. That's another thing to talk about, actually. But first, typical, typical day at home. <laughs> typical day at home for me. Um, usually oats in the morning because a lot of the time I'm commuting to work, so I've got to have something that I can eat cold and can eat on the train, so it doesn't leave me with a huge amount of options. So yep. I usually soak some oats overnight with some fruit, some berries, some apple, some flax, a uh, little bit of little bit of soy milk and some water and I eat that on my way on my way to work or I eat it at home if I'm at home in the day. Um, lunch is always pretty much leftovers from the night bef- the leftovers from dinner from yep. the night before. So whenever I'm cooking, I don't make there's usually two of us. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't make two portions of anything. I always make four or six or eight, and we always take the leftovers for lunch. It just makes it just makes life easier for us, and and usually it's something that we'll just warm up, warm up at work, and that means you know when you do make even more servings, you can stick them in the freezer, and when you don't feel like cooking, they're there. Um, and yeah, so those are leftovers from dinner, and dinner can be can be anything it's either usually a starch you know brown rice potatoes sweet potatoes wholemeal pasta or a different whole grain um paired with uh, a legume usually something like lentils or chickpeas and a bunch of vegetables so we'll make a lot of curries we make a lot of mexican chilies we make a lot of um pasta dishes with you know really veg heavy sauces a lot of the time We'll have a salad with dinner as well just to get in um, some more veggies at the end of the day because sometimes you're really busy. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it. Oats for breakfast, leftovers yep. for lunch, typical whole food plant-based meal for dinner, you know. Uh, and in between, fruit, raw veggies. Um, sometimes I bake, you know. I bake healthy muffins or nice. bars and... We'll have those as a snack. Sometimes we'll have extra oats yep. uh, with fruit as a snack. Sometimes we'll have whole grain toast with, uh, you know, with sliced tomatoes as a snack. Just depends how hungry we are. So Yeah. Keeping it simple though, Keep basically. Keep it simple. Yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, so one, two more questions. Actually, no, traveling. What's a traveling, traveling. day? I do get a lot of people, oh, I'd like to do this, but I travel a lot for work. So what can I do? And so... That's another preparation thing, yeah. you know, plan ahead. It's not always possible when you're traveling because if you have really big travel days and you can't keep stuff cold, it's tricky. But yeah, plan ahead, you know. Yeah. Uh, if I'm just doing a day trip or something, I'll bake potatoes, we'll pack those, make some sandwiches, um, some homemade, you know, the day before, make some homemade hummus, get some get some uh, whole grain bread, make sandwiches, cut up veggies, pack some fruit and, and that's it. You're done. Um, yeah. When I'm traveling like a long way, you know, from Europe to Australia, I might grab some things that I wouldn't normally eat. So things like the fruit, you know, the fruit and nut bars, just in case I'm totally stuck and, and can't eat can't eat anything. But I always try to book accommodation where I can cook. Um, yeah, well, this place is nice. Yeah, you this got a is good great. Kitchen, good kitchen here. So yeah. yeah, you know, using Airbnb. And you got a supermarket across the road. Oh, got that the big, way, isn't it? The yeah. big coals across the road, yeah. which has been fantastic. Yeah, so you you know, just pl- again planning ahead. Yeah. Try and get a place where you can cook, prepare your meals, bring some ingredients if you if you know it's going to be necessary, and and do a little bit of research beforehand so that you can set yourself up to to make better choices while you're away. Of course, you will 
invariably have to make some compromises sometimes, but the less compromises you you can make, the better. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, last question then. How how do we make it, you know, whole food, plant-based eating and veganism, two things we've talked about, they are growing, but how can we, what can we do to speed it up? How can we get people to realize that, you know, this is a good, healthy way to eat and embrace it? Yeah, that's a difficult question because I've seen, I mean, I have seen it explode. I've seen it, you know, from veganism in particular from 13, 14 years ago. It's, yeah. it's just in a completely different place. And I think, um, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, the internet and social media has been yeah. hugely helpful uh, in that in that respect. Um, I just think getting out there and being, posi- being positive about the message yeah. and, and sharing it with people who want to hear it and, and um, just demonstrating how it can be done. Um, it's sharing i think i think especially um things like transformation stories like your own you know um people who have overcome health obstacles um you know getting those stories out there so that people can see that you know this is something that can really help them or help their friends or help their family um that they don't have to live with with certain chronic diseases that they don't they don't have to you know um maybe go through what their parents went through if they had heart disease or they developed type 2 diabetes later in life i think i'm getting off track here again that's okay but but yeah i mean if it's something you're passionate about be a good example and get out there and 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 spread the message you know um organize things in your area you know put together little meetings even if five or six people come well they might tell their friends have a potluck bring some food um you know give give lend people dvds order all the documentaries order what the health and forks over knives and get the dvds and and lend them to people take them to your local library so people can rent them out there's there's all sorts of ways you can get the message out there yeah, cool might seem slow but it'll it's take though. yeah, <laughs> yeah it is happening yeah oh, cool all right look can you leave us with uh one can you can you uh encapsulate your message in a sentence or maybe maybe a sentence is too much maybe a paragraph <laughs> my message oh uh, you put, no, you put me I'll, on I'll the put spot you on the now. spot but i do like to ask this without warning so that uh, i just see what what comes to mind um oh <laughs> I seem to really, really be That's stuck right. now. Jet lag. Jet um, lag's hurting. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. My message is basically, um, you know, um, keep it simple. Keep I think I've perfect. said that in another podcast that I yeah. did and I think I just keep saying the same thing. But that's really what I try to do. Yeah. Um, show people, uh, keep it simple. Yeah. Don't overcomplicate things. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Um, and, you know, what I do is aimed at helping people do exactly that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, actually. That's a, a keep it simple is a huge thing for me as well. And it's something I, I talk to a lot of people about. Overcomplicating things is a, is a big deal. So it took some thought, but I think you got to a good, good Thank point you. at the Maybe end. Maybe you can edit that giant gap. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, all right, so where if, if people want to, people are into you and want to find more, want to want to connect with you a bit more, how can they do that? Uh, you can head to the website. It's plantplate.com. Yep. Uh, you can send me an email from there. You can find Plant Plate on Facebook. It's just one word, yep. one word together. Um, so you can follow there for updates. Uh, you can also get in touch with me through the Plant Plate Facebook group, uh, which is actually called whole food plant-based on five dollars a day that's the group that i run it's a bit of a support group for people who are using the menu plans who want to learn how to eat this way on a budget so those are those are the three best places and what was the website you said where you can get the book payhip.com slash plant plate all right that's where both the books are available i must have been there because uh, i bought the book but (laughs) it was a a while ago so i've I've forgotten where that where that was but anyway so uh anyway all those links i'll I'll put them in the show notes on my website so 
don't worry if you forgot to take a note there. Just look on spudfit.com at the at the page for this podcast and you'll get links to, to go wherever you need to go. All right. That's that then. We're done. How do you feel? I feel pretty good. All right. I feel pretty good, yeah. Ready for another sleep? Ready for another sleep. <laughs> All right. Uh, Emma Roche, thank you for joining us on the SpudFit podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. And spud up. What did you think of that? I had a really great time talking to Emma. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Isn't she great? She's full of life and positivity. I, uh, I felt really great when I finished that conversation. And I feel good after having listened to it again too. <laughs> All right, if you want to support more of what Emma's doing, go to plantplate.com and find out everything you need to know about Emma and her work there. And once again, if you'd like to uh, get involved a little bit more with what I'm doing, you can get my book, The DIY Spud Fit Challenge. It's available on my website or on Amazon, spudfit.com. You can also take the challenge, go to spudfit.com. If you want to do your own Spud Fit Challenge and get support, go to the website and find it there. Uh, like and share and subscribe and all that. Tell all your friends about the Spud Fit podcast. Again, if you uh, feel so inclined and have the means available, then I would greatly appreciate any support anyone can give me on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash spudfit or find the link in the show notes page. Again, the Amazon uh, option is there too. If you are going to buy something on Amazon, then please click through my website and, uh, and it won't cost you a cent extra, but it'll give me a little bit of loose change to help keep the lights on here. Uh, that's that for today. Again, go to Emma, go to Emma's page, plantplate.com. And, uh, I hope that this has helped simplify the way you think about food. And, uh, and I hope it has also helped to, uh, lighten the load that the grocery bill brings. All right. That's enough from me. Enjoy your days, everyone. And spud up. Oh, hang on. I forgot again. <laughs> I'm in good form today. The daiquiri. Support my wife's amazing, uh, not just support, just get yourself some awesome track, track pants, tracky dacks, the daiquiri.com. Uh, amazing artwork for your ass. Comfortable and luxurious pants with amazing works of art made from organic bamboo and cotton. Uh, get into them at the daiquiri.com. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and I hope you enjoy eating a wholesome diet of whole food plant-based eating for $5 a day for the next week until the next podcast. Thanks, everyone. Spot up.